Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the director of public programs here at the Hammer Museum, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's Hammer Forum on, current Supreme, on the current Supreme Court with UC Berkeley um, Law School Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and I also want to quickly mention some upcoming Hammer programs you might be interested in. Next Tuesday evening, we're having a panel discussion on the explosion of Chinese contemporary art during the period of massive economic development in the 1990s. And on Sunday, we have a talk by the LA Opera's conductor, Maestro James Conlon, on Debussy, the first Impressionist composer. So I hope you'll come back and join us for those programs. So now on to tonight's program. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the generous support of the Rosenblum family. We are so honored to have Erwin Chemerinsky here tonight. And it's just amazing to me that he actually agreed to give a three-part lecture series on the current and future state of the United States Supreme Court and the cases it's considering that will affect all of our lives. The first talk was last month, and Dean Chemerinsky addressed the decisions that were released in the last court session, especially those pertaining to abortion, religion, the right to bear arms, and the administrative state. That talk is available on the Hammer channel, and I recommend you check it out. Tonight, he'll talk about the cases that the Supreme Court is currently considering. And for the final lecture, which will be on March 22nd, he'll discuss the idea of originalism in interpreting the US Constitution. As you'll see shortly, Dean Chemerinsky is a brilliant legal scholar who literally wrote the textbook on constitutional law. Despite being a renowned academic and scholar and dean of the Berkeley School of Law, he speaks about these topics with such crystal clear language that translates legalese into something we can all understand. I think he would want us all to read the Constitution for ourselves and see that it's something you can actually read and interpret. And for that reason, and please silence your cell phones, um, for that reason we distributed free paperback copies of the US Constitution to all of you in the audience so that you can read it. Um, and see the actual wording of the Founding Fathers for yourselves. Chemerinsky is the rock star of the legal world. A study of legal publications found he's the most frequently cited American legal scholar, and the National Jurist Magazine named him the most influential person in legal education in the United States. He also writes regular columns for the Sacramento Bee and the ABA Journal and op-eds for prominent newspapers across the country. And he's argued several cases at the United States Supreme Court and has written numerous amicus briefs. He's the author of many, many books, including Interpreting the Constitution, Constitutional Law, Principles and Policies, The First Amendment, The Religion Clause, clause The Case for Separating Church and State, The Conservative Assault on the Constitution, and the case against the Supreme Court. In 2017 alone, he published three books, We the People, a progressive reading of the Constitution for the 21st century, and Closing the Courthouse Doors, How Your Constitutional Rights Became Unenforceable, and also Free Speech on Campus, co-written with Howard Gilman. Um, one of his most recent books include, is Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights. And he's just published a new book called Worse Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism. And in it, he talks about how what was once a fringe theory of a few extremely conservative legal scholars has now become a well-accepted mode of constitutional interpretation. So I just feel incredibly fortunate to have him come here and speak with all of us today. And after today's talk and audience Q&A, we're going to have some light refreshments and copies of his books for sale in the theater lobby, and Professor Chemerinsky will be happy to sign some books for you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest speaker, Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and the warm welcome. It's truly my great honor and pleasure to be here. I was deeply touched when the Hammer asked me to come do this three-part lecture series on the United States Supreme Court. It's an appropriate time for talking about the United States Supreme Court and the Constitution. It's not hyperbole to say that it's truly a momentous time in American history when it comes to the court. The first lecture tried to talk about how we got here and what the Supreme Court did last year. Between 1960 and 2020, 
There were 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president, almost exactly even. Between 1960 and 2020, Republican presidents picked 15 justices, whereas Democratic presidents picked only eight justices. Or to put it another way, in talking about how we got here with regard to the court, President Donald Trump picked three justices in his four years in the White House. The prior three Democratic presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, so to combine 20 years in the White House, and in those two decades, they picked only four justices. Tonight, I want to talk about what these justices mean this year in the Supreme Court, what we can expect between now and the end of June of 2023. And then in a month, on March 22nd, I want to look to the future. And what's it going to mean to have a Supreme Court that's committed to originalism, the view that the meaning of a constitutional provision is fixed when it's adopted and can change only by amendment. When I spoke here last month and focused on last term of the Supreme Court, I said I could identify three themes with regard to the court and its jurisprudence. First, above all, it follows the conservative political agenda. Second, it's a court that gives little weight to precedent, to what often the law is called stare decisis. And third, it's a court that gives little consideration to the human consequences of its decisions. And so if you think back to last term, in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. After 49 years, no longer is there a right to abortion in the United States. You see the three themes I just mentioned, following the conservative political agenda, giving no weight to precedent, and paying no attention to the human consequences of this decision. The day before that, the Supreme Court gave the Second Amendment the broadest reading ever in American history. In New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the Supreme Court said that the only gun regulations that would be allowed are those that were historically permitted in 1791 when the Second Amendment was adopted. In fact, since I spoke here last month, just a couple of weeks ago, a federal court of appeals struck down a federal law that made it a crime for a person who was in a restraining order in a domestic violence case possessing a firearm. The federal court of appeals said, in light of the Supreme Court decision, there were no laws in 1791 that kept people who were under restraining orders in domestic violence cases from having guns, so Congress can't prohibit it today. Again, it's a court following the conservative political agenda. It's a court that gave no weight to precedent. It's a court that paid no attention to the human consequences of guns in our society. Just a few days later, on Monday, June 27th, the court decided Kennedy versus Bremerton schools. The court found that a high school football coach had the First Amendment right to go on the field after games and pray, including having students join him in those prayers. Once more, the court followed the conservative desire to expand free exercise of religion. The court overruled a precedent almost 50 years old that separated church and state. And the court paid no attention to the coercion that students will feel to join their teachers when they engage in prayer. One more example that I talked about last month came down on Thursday, June 30th, West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. The Supreme Court said that the Environmental Protection Agency lacked the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. These are a major source of the pollution that's leading to the climate change that endangers the planet. Here, too, the court follows the conservative political agenda and a desire to limit the regulatory state and protect business. The court developed an unprecedented new theory to limit administrative power, and the court gave no weight to the consequences that climate change poses in endangering the planet and all life upon it. Well, what I want to do tonight is show how these three themes are likely to affect what the Supreme Court's going to do 
between now and the end of June. And I again want to emphasize what this is likely to mean for all of us, often in the most important, the most intimate aspects of our lives. The Supreme Court will decide again this year about 55 cases with signed opinions after briefing an oral argument. I want to focus on three areas in some depth. Affirmative action, elections, and the First Amendment, especially with regard to religion, but also with regard to speech. I'll conclude by offering some thoughts as we go into the future to set up what I'm going to talk about next month, and then, as was announced, we'll have about a half hour for questions and answers. So let me start with the first area, affirmative action. And here I'm talking about two cases that were argued in the Supreme Court on Monday, October 31st. Students for Fair Admission versus University of North Carolina and Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard College. To appreciate these cases, I need to put them in historical context. In 1978, the Supreme Court decided the landmark case, Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. Alan Bakke was a white man who applied for admission to the University of California Davis Medical School. The University of California Davis Medical School had an entering class each year of 100 students. It had found over the past decade, if it engaged in no forms of affirmative action, it would average less than one student of color a year. So the University of California Davis Medical School said, it was going to set aside 16 slots in its entering class of 100 for minority students. It said this was not a quota. If there weren't 16 qualified students of color, they would accept fewer. If there were more than 16 qualified students of color, they would take more. When Alan Bakke was not admitted to the University of California at Davis Medical School, he sued and said their consideration of race violated the Constitution and offended federal law. There was no majority opinion for the Supreme Court. The justices were split, one, four, four. Four justices said that affirmative action violates federal law. No need to reach the Constitution. There's a federal statute, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, that says that recipients of federal funds cannot discriminate on the basis of race. That law will be very important when I talk about the Harvard case now before the court. These four justices said that all affirmative action violates Title VI, period. Four justices said that we should allow affirmative action. There's a long history of race discrimination in the United States. Affirmative action is necessary as a way of remedying that history of discrimination. These justices said there's a fundamental difference between the government discriminating against those who are historically discriminated against on account of their race and the government giving a benefit to those who are historically discriminated in order to remedy past discrimination. Justice Lewis Powell wrote for just himself. He said that he believes that all racial classifications, whether to benefit minorities or to harm minorities, should be suspect. In the language of constitutional law, he said all should receive what's called strict scrutiny. That simply means that the government's going to need to have a compelling reason for what it's doing, and the government's going to have to show there's no other way to achieve its goal. Paul said affirmative action, like invidious discrimination against racial minorities, should have to meet strict scrutiny. Just as Paul said that colleges and universities have a compelling interest having a diverse student body. He said colleges and universities may use race as one factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. It's important that Justice Powell and four other justices rejected the idea that there could be affirmative action as a way of remedying past discrimination. Justice Powell said the only justification for affirmative action that should be accepted is enhancing diversity. 25 years later, in Grutter versus Bollinger, Justice Powell's opinion for himself became the majority view of the Supreme Court and has been the law ever since. 
Grutter versus Bollinger involved the University of Michigan Law School. It followed what Justice Pollitt prescribed a quarter century earlier. It said it would consider many factors in admitting students. Among the things that would be looked at was race. Race would be one consideration to benefit students of color. Barbara Grutter applied for the University of Michigan Law School, white woman. She was rejected. And she sued and said the consideration of race violated equal protection. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, ruled against Barbara Grutter and upheld the University of Michigan Law School Affirmative Action Program. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who had appointed the court by President Ronald Reagan, wrote the majority opinion. Justice O'Connor echoed what Lewis Paul had said 25 years earlier. Justice O'Connor said, colleges and universities have a compelling interest in diversity. The learning of all students is enhanced when there's a diverse student body. She said, preparing law students for the society they're going to be in, for representing a diverse clientele, requires that they associate with other diverse students. She said that, therefore, the University of Michigan Law School, college universities more generally, may use race as one factor in admission decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. The Supreme Court became more conservative in the years that followed. And by the beginning of the last decade, it was thought maybe there was a majority to overrule Bakke and Grutter and end affirmative action. When the case came to the Supreme Court, it was Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. Abigail Fisher, a white woman, applied for admission to the University of Texas at Austin. The University of Texas, in order to achieve diversity, had created a top 10% plan. They said they would take the top 10% of every public high school in Texas as a way of achieving racial diversity. Texas is sufficiently racially segregated that indeed this would yield some degree of diversity. But the regents the University of Texas felt that this wasn't enough. And so they also said they would look at many factors in admission, one of them being race. Abigail Fisher sued and argued this was unconstitutional. When it finally came to the Supreme Court for the last time in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled against Abigail Fisher and upheld the University of Texas Affirmative Action Program. It was a four to three decision, which is unusual. Why was it only seven justices? Well, that was the year Justice Scalia died, and he obviously wasn't therefore able to participate in the decision. And Justice Kagan was recused because she was the Solicitor General of the United States when the matter first arose in the Supreme Court. The four justices in the majority were Anthony Kennedy, writing the opinion, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. Justice Samuel Alito wrote the dissent, joined by Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Kennedy, in strong language, reaffirmed that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body, that college universities can use race is one fact among many to achieve diversity. It said the University of Texas adequately demonstrated it had no other way to achieve diversity. Well, Fisher versus University of Texas Austin was decided not quite seven years ago. Why is the issue of affirmative action back before the court? Since 2016, three conservative justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, have joined that bench, and they joined the three dissenters, Roberts, Alito, and Thomas. Two of the justices in the majority of Fisher, Anthony Kennedy and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, are no longer on the court. And so this set the stage for the two cases that were argued on October 31st. Students for Fair Admission versus the University of North Carolina was a lawsuit brought to challenge the University of North Carolina's Affirmative Action Program. The same man, Edward Blum, funded this in the Harvard case. He'd also funded the Fisher case, challenging the University of Texas Affirmative Action Program. The Federal District Court in North Carolina 
upheld that university's affirmative action program. The federal district court found that the University of North Carolina had demonstrated that there was no other way to achieve diversity except some form of affirmative action. Before the Federal Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals, the Fourth Circuit could rule, the Supreme Court granted review in the case. Equal protection, and more generally the Constitution, apply only to the government. Private entities, including private universities, don't have to comply with the Constitution. So Harvard College doesn't have to comply with the 14th Amendment, equal protection, or the Constitution. But... Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act says recipients of federal funds can't discriminate based on race, and Harvard, like almost every private university, gets federal money. Harvard was challenged for having its affirmative action program. This was a suit brought on behalf of Asian American students who said they were disadvantaged by Harvard giving preference to black and Latinx students. A federal district court in Boston held a lengthy trial and found no evidence of discrimination against Asian American students and upheld the Harvard program as using race as one factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities. The United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit affirmed and the Supreme Court granted review. The oral arguments on October 31st in these two cases lasted five and a half hours. I don't think there's anyone, liberal or conservative, who heard the arguments who has doubts of what the Supreme Court is going to do. The Supreme Court is going to overrule Bakke, Grutter, and Fisher. The Supreme Court is going to say that colleges and universities cannot engage in affirmative action. There's going to be an immediate devastating consequence for diversity in college universities across the country. It's estimated that 60% of selective colleges and universities across the country engage in some form of affirmative action. There are nine states, including California, that have already eliminated affirmative action. As I'm sure you know, in 1996, California voters passed Proposition 209 that says that the state and all of its political subdivisions cannot discriminate or give preference based on race or sex in education, contracting, or employment. The statistics about diversity, say at UCLA and Berkeley, show what we're likely to see across the country with regard to the elimination of affirmative action. If you compare, say, the number of black and Latinx students at UCLA and Berkeley in 1995 compared to 1998, the year before Prop 209 and two years after, it fell by half. Or take my law school, University of California at Berkeley. In the year after Prop 209, there was only one black student in the entering class, and that was somebody who had been admitted before Prop 209 in deferred attendance. It took UCLA 19 years until the year 2015 to get back to its pre-1996 levels of diversity. To be sure, schools in California have found ways of achieving diversity without affirmative action, but it was enormously difficult. It took concerted effort, took a lot of trial and error. I think we're going to see the same thing across the country. But I'm sure there'll be some schools that don't have the dedication of, say, UCLA and Berkeley, won't put in the concerted effort. And even if they do, It will take a long period of time. I've been a law professor now for 43 years. I've taught courses like constitutional law and criminal procedure in classes that were almost all white and in classes with a significant number of diverse students. It is a radically different educational opportunity when you talk about things like affirmative action or about the police stopping people for driving while black It's very different when you have students in the room who can relate their own personal experiences. These cases will come down sometime between now and the end of June. My guess is more towards the latter. The major cases usually come down, as you know, at the end of June. And there's certainly things to look for as you read the opinions or the media accounts of the opinion. How does the Supreme Court explain overruling Bakke and Grutter and Fisher? 
Does it say that diversity is not to be regarded as a compelling interest? That's what Justice Clarence Thomas said at oral argument. Or does the Supreme Court go even further and say that the Constitution requires that the government always be colorblind? If the Supreme Court says that the government must always be colorblind, the implications will be enormous. There are many federal and state laws that allow liability on proof of a racially discriminatory impact. You can prove violation of federal law with regard to employment discrimination by demonstrating a practice has a racially discriminatory impact. You can prove housing discrimination by demonstrating a racially discriminatory impact. If the Supreme Court says that the government must always be colorblind, then it's hard to see how such laws will survive. Inevitably, in order to avoid liability, decision makers have to take race into account. In fact, Justice Antonin Scalia, in an opinion in 2009, expressed his view that allowing disparate impact liability is inconsistent with the principle of colorblindness. Also, as you read the opinions or the accounts of the opinion, it would be important to see what does the Supreme Court say about using proxies for race? I gave you the example of the Texas Top 10% Plan. In order to achieve racial diversity, they took the top 10% from all the high schools in the state. Is that going to still be permissible? Since it's done with the purpose of racial diversity, and if successful as the effect of racial diversity, does it violate the Constitution? How much is the court going to limit the ability to use such proxies to achieve diversity? No college, no university, no law school has ever admitted students solely on the basis of grades and test scores. They've always considered a variety of factors. I taught at USC for 21 years. My guess is that football players were admitted there without the same grades and test scores. I taught at Duke for a period of time. My guess is the basketball players didn't have the same grades and test scores. It's always been easier to get into Harvard or Yale if you're from, say, Montana or North Dakota. All this reflects diversity. And yet, is the Supreme Court going to say the one kind of diversity that doesn't matter is racial diversity? The second area that I want to talk about tonight with regard to the Supreme Court concerns elections. And there are two very important cases that have already been argued in the Supreme Court with regard to elections. One involves the Voting Rights Act, and the other involves the Constitution. The former is a case called Merrill versus Milligan, and it was argued on October 4th of 2022. Again, let me provide a little bit of background. This country has a long and despicable history of race discrimination in voting. As recently as 1964, less than 40% of eligible black voters were registered in Mississippi, similar number in Alabama and other southern states. I think one of the most important statutes adopted by Congress in my lifetime was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It did many things, but two were especially important. Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act said that state and local governments that had a history of race discrimination in voting had to get pre-approval before significant change in their election system. This was called pre-clearance, and it generally would have to come from the Attorney General. Congress was aware that state and local governments, especially in the South, were continually adopting new ways of disenfranchising voters of color. Do you know the arcade game Whack-A-Mole, where you knock it down in one place and it pops up another? That's what Congress thought was going on with regard to disenfranchising of minority voters. A southern state would adopt a practice to keep people of color from voting, only for it to be struck down and withdrawn, and another one to pop up, another one to pop up. And so Congress wanted a preventative mechanism. It said, for jurisdictions with a proven history of race discrimination voting, they couldn't impose a significant change in their elected system without getting pre-approval for the Attorney General. This is a provision that worked enormously well. There were hundreds of instances where the attorney general denied a change in the election system because they have a racially discriminatory impact. There were likely thousands of instances 
where the state and local governments never tried because they know they wouldn't get pre-approval. Under the most recent formula in terms of where to get pre-approval, it was nine states, almost all in the South, and local governments throughout the country. This provision was extended in 1981 for 25 years. It was President Ronald Reagan who signed that extension. It was scheduled to expire in 2007. So Congress held over a dozen hearings. It compiled a legislative history of over 15,000 pages, proving continued race discrimination in the jurisdictions that needed to get preclearance, demonstrating the tremendous success of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. The vote in the Senate was 98 to nothing to extend this for another 25 years. Can you imagine the Senate today passing anything 98 to nothing? There were only 32 votes against this in the House of Representatives. President George W. Bush signed it into law. But on June 25th, 2013, in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional the requirement for preclearance. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for a five-person conservative majority. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote one of her most famous iconic dissents. Chief Justice Roberts said the requirement for preclearance violated the constitutional requirement of equal state sovereignty. He said, Congress is required to treat all states the same. For Congress to require that some states get preclearance offends this principle. I challenge any of you in the constitutions that are now in your lap to find a provision in the Constitution that says Congress has to treat all states the same. It's not there. As I'll talk about in the next lecture on March 22nd, I am certainly not an originalist. But if one were an originalist, it'd be impossible to defend the principle of equal state sovereignty. The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment, 1868, also passed the Reconstruction Act that created military rule over the former rebel states. Hard to imagine anything more inconsistent with equal state sovereignty than that. So since 2013, no jurisdictions have had to get preclearance. Immediately, states like North Carolina and Texas put in place laws with a discriminatory effect against minority voters, which had been previously denied preclearance. Statistics show that between 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was adopted, and Shelby County v. Holder in 2013, there was a steady increase over time, year to year, in Black and Latinx voter participation. Since 2013, though, Black voter participation has gone down by 2.5%, the first reduction since the adoption of the Voting Rights Act. Shelby County has had an enormous effect. Well, I said there were two provisions of the Voting Rights Act that were crucial. Indeed, in his majority opinion in Shelby County, Chief Justice Roberts said, I know we're striking down Section 5 in preclearance, but there's still Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 says that state and local governments can't have election systems that have a discriminatory effect against minority voters. It's enforced by lawsuits. Congress amended this in 1982 to make clear that proof of a racially discriminatory impact is enough to demonstrate a violation of the Voting Rights Act. It doesn't have to be proven there was a discriminatory intent. In July of 2021, the Supreme Court decided Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee. This involved when can a state or local election practice be challenged as having a racially discriminatory impact? Brnovich came out of Arizona. It involved two provisions of Arizona law. One said that when it comes to absentee ballots, it had to be turned in by a person or a relative of a person. No one else could turn in the absentee ballot. And the other said that a vote would be counted only if someone cast it in his or her own precinct. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit found that these provisions violated the Voting Rights Act. Judge William Fletcher wrote for the court. As to the former, he said, when it comes to Native American reservations, 
the many individuals don't have access to postal services. And so they need somebody else to turn in the absentee ballot. So the limit had a racially discriminatory effect against Native Americans. As the latter, he said, the evidence in the case demonstrated that polling places were much more often moved in communities of color than white communities. And so the requirement that the vote be cast in the precinct had a racially discriminatory effect. The Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, reversed the Ninth Circuit. Justice Alito wrote for the current six conservatives on the court. Justice Kagan wrote a scathing dissent joined by Justice Breyer and Sotomayor. Justice Alito said that in deciding whether there's a violation of the Voting Rights Act, courts have to look at a number of considerations. Among them, he said, courts have to balance the state's interest in preventing voter fraud. Again, I can issue a challenge. Read the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and find anything in it about weighing the state's interest in preventing voter fraud. You won't find anything in it at all with regard to the issue of voter fraud. And there's no proof. There's not even an allegation that the Arizona law had an effect in preventing voter fraud. The Supreme Court has thus made it much harder to challenge state and local election laws that have a discriminatory impact against minority voters. And we know that since the November 2020 election, 19 states have adopted dozens of restrictions on voting. These are all states with Republican legislatures and Republican governors, very much aimed, especially keeping voters of color being able to go to the polling place. Well, the other place where Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act comes up is with regard to how election districts are drawn. And it's always been understood that state and local governments can't draw election districts with the effect of discriminating against minority voters. That, perhaps above all, is why Congress amended the law in 1982. That brings me to the case now pending before the court, argued on October 4th, Merrill versus Milligan. It comes from the state of Alabama. Alabama's population is 27% black individuals. There are seven congressional districts in Alabama. After the 2020 census, they drew new congressional district boundaries. The way in which the districts are drawn, there is a substantial majority black population in one of the seven districts and a small black population in the other six districts. This was done intentionally. They packed the black voters as much as they could in one district and split the black voters as much as they could among the other districts. So it was likely that only one black would be elected to Congress from Alabama, even though its population is 27% African-American. A three-judge federal court found that this violated the Voting Rights Act. And it's worth noting that two of those three judges have been appointed to the court by President Donald Trump. The Supreme Court, as I said, has heard the case. And I would say the conventional wisdom is that the Supreme Court is going to rule in favor of Alabama and make it much harder to prove that districting violates the Voting Rights Act, that it discriminates on the basis of race. The other case with regard to elections is Moore versus Harper. It was argued on Wednesday, December 7th. If you would ask me, what's the case before the Supreme Court this term that I'm most worried about, it's Moore versus Harper. It involves the so-called independent state legislature theory. Again, a little bit of background, and then I'll try to explain why this case is so important. North Carolina is basically a purple state. It went for Obama in 2008, Romney in 2012, and Trump in the last two presidential elections. But always it was very close. In 2020, Donald Trump beat Joe Biden in North Carolina by 1.35% of all of the votes cast. When Republicans got control of the North Carolina state legislature in the middle of last decade, they immediately engaged in redistricting. At the time, there were 13 congressional districts in North Carolina. And the person who was in charge of redistricting said the goal would be to give Republicans 10 of 13 seats. And he said, if we can find a way to draft a map that gives Republicans more than that, we'll do so. The Republicans ran through a computer 
thousand different maps of how to draw congressional districts. And they picked the one that they thought was most likely to give Republicans control of 10 of 13 seats. To no one's surprise, it worked. In 2016, North Carolina elected 10 Republican representatives and three Democratic representatives to Congress. In 2018, Democrats and Republicans statewide got almost exactly the same number of votes for seats for Congress, but Republicans won 10 of 13 seats. This was challenged in federal court, and the case was Rucho versus Common Cause, and was decided by the Supreme Court in June of 2019. And the Supreme Court ruled five to four, split along ideological lines, that federal courts cannot hear challenges to partisan gerrymandering. That's, of course, exactly what I hear. Partisan gerrymandering is where the political party that controls the legislature draws election districts to maximize seats for that party. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for the conservative majority, Justice Elena Kagan for the four liberals, and Chief Justice Roberts said that federal courts never can hear challenges to partisan gerrymandering no matter how extreme or egregious. But he did say towards the end of the opinion, state courts can hear challenges that it violates their own state constitutions. States can, like California has done, create independent districting commissions to eliminate partisan gerrymandering. After the 2020 census, the North Carolina legislature set out to redraw congressional districts. There are now 14 seats in the House of Representatives from North Carolina. That is because there's been a population increase in the state since the last decennial census. And the Republicans set out to give to Republicans control of at least 10 of the 14 seats. A challenge was brought in North Carolina state court under the North Carolina state constitution. States, under their constitutions, can always protect more rights than exist under the U.S. Constitution. The North Carolina Supreme Court found that the partisan gerrymandering violated the North Carolina state constitution. It created an independent, nonpartisan commission to redraw congressional districts. They were used in the November 2022 elections, and not surprisingly, Republicans won seven seats in Congress from North Carolina, and Democrats won seven seats. The Republicans in the North Carolina legislature, though, took the matter to the United States Supreme Court. They said, for the North Carolina Supreme Court to find this violated the North Carolina Constitution, violated the United States Constitution. And the reason they said was what's called the independent state legislature theory. They base this on a provision in Article I, Section 4 of the Constitution that says that the legislature of each state shall determine the manner, time, and place of electing members to Congress. They say this gives to the North Carolina legislature the only and final word the North Carolina court cannot enforce the North Carolina Constitution. Now, this is inconsistent the most basic principles of judicial review. Where Congress has powers under the Constitution, the courts can always review to see if they're exercised constitutionally. It's always been thought that when a state legislature has power, the state courts can see if it violates the state Constitution. But the advocates of the independent state legislature theories say that the courts shouldn't have any opportunity to review. It's left solely to the legislature. If the Supreme Court accepts this, then it would mean that no court, federal or state, can ever stop partisan gerrymandering, no matter how extreme. It would mean no longer can California and other states that have them use independent districting commissions, because it's only the legislature that can draw districts. But the implications go even beyond that. There's another provision in the Constitution It's found in Article 2, Section 1, and it says that the legislature of each state shall determine the allocation of that state's electors in the Electoral College. After the 2020 election, President Donald Trump urged Republican legislators in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, 
to give him those states electoral votes, notwithstanding the fact that the states had laws that said the electoral vote should go to the winner of the popular vote. If the Supreme Court adopts the independent state legislature theory, then a state legislature would be able to allocate that state's electors to whoever they want, regardless of who won the popular vote, regardless of the fact that the states have laws that say that the electors should go to the winner of the popular vote in the state. In fact, in Bush versus Gore, on December 12, 2000, Chief Justice Rehnquist, in a concurring opinion, joined by Justice Scalia and Thomas, advanced the independent state legislature theory for presidential elections. That's, many people believe, was the origin of the independent state legislature theory. So imagine that the 2024 presidential election is as close as the 2020 election. Imagine that the Democratic candidate again wins, say, by 7 million votes as in 2020 or even more. But imagine that a series of Republican state legislatures decide they're going to give the electors of that state to the Republican candidate who lost the popular vote in the state. Imagine that decides the outcome of the Electoral College. I question whether our democracy could survive that happening. That's why the stakes of Moore versus Harper are so grave. The third area that I want to talk about tonight concerns the First Amendment, especially with regard to religion and speech. And the case here that I want to talk about is 303 Creative versus Alenis that was argued in the Supreme Court on Monday, December the 5th. Again, let me tell you the facts of the case, tell you what I think is going to happen and why it matters so much. Colorado has a law that prohibits business establishments from discriminating with regard to service on the basis of race, sex, religion, or sexual orientation. Lori Smith has a business in Colorado of designing websites. And she says she wants to expand her business to design websites for weddings. But she says on account of her religious beliefs, she doesn't want to design websites for same-sex weddings. So she brought a lawsuit in federal court in Denver saying to apply the Colorado law to her would violate her free exercise of religion and her freedom of speech. The federal district court ruled against Lori Smith. The federal district court said that Colorado has a compelling interest in stopping discrimination against gays and lesbians, and that that justifies any interference with her free speech or free exercise of religion. The United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit agreed and ruled against Lori Smith. The Supreme Court granted review. Interestingly, the Supreme Court granted review just on the question of whether it violates Lori Smith's free speech rights to apply the Colorado law against her. The court didn't grant review on the religion question, but there's no doubt that the religion question underlies this case. The reason that Lori Smith said she didn't want to provide services to same-sex weddings was on account of a religious belief. Now, if this Colorado law, and if these facts sound somewhat familiar, you might remember another Supreme Court case from now almost five years ago in 2018, Master Peak Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. It involved a same-sex couple that wanted to get a wedding cake to celebrate their marriage. They went to a local bakery, Masterpiece Cake Shop, and asked the proprietor to design the cake and to bake the cake for them. He refused, saying that same-sex weddings were against his religious beliefs, and he would be complicit if he would go about designing and baking a cake for them. They brought an action against Master Peace Cake Shop and its owner, Jack Phillips, in the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. The Colorado Civil Rights Commission ruled in favor of the gay couple, ruled that it violated the Colorado state statute. The Colorado Court of Appeals affirmed. I told my students you might understand the ruling here with the adage, bakers can't be choosers. <laughs> the United States Supreme Court granted review in the case, and then didn't decide the broad question. It ruled very narrowly, and without reaching the issue of, 
did the baker here have a free speech or a free exercise of religion question. But now that issue is back before the Supreme Court. I don't think there's anyone, liberal or conservative, who listened to the oral arguments with a doubt about what the Supreme Court is likely to do. They're going to rule in favor of Lori Smith and say that she had a First Amendment right to violate the Colorado anti-discrimination law and a right to refuse to serve same-sex couples. But here, too, the implications of this are enormous. Think of the landlord who says, it violates my religious beliefs to rent property to an interracial couple. Or imagine the employer who says, it violates my religious beliefs to have men and women work in the same workplace, so I'm not going to hire women. How are these situations in any way distinguishable? There's always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. For decades, our society has made the choice that stopping discrimination is more important than protecting freedom to discriminate. Decades ago, when the Civil Rights Act was first adopted, a business tried to bring a challenge and say that the owner should have a religious right to refuse to serve blacks based on the person's deeply held spiritual beliefs. And the Supreme Court rejected that argument. But now the courts for the first time are going to say that people do have the freedom to discriminate on account of religious beliefs. And it's impossible to see how it will be Kevin. It will be the first time that the Supreme Court has ever said protecting freedom to discriminate is more important than the government's interest in ending discrimination. So these are what I regard as the most important matters on the Supreme Court's docket this term. As I look to the future, and this, of course, is what I'm going to be talking about in the next lecture on March 22nd, it's so important to keep in mind the ages of the justices. Clarence Thomas is the oldest of the justices. He's 74 years old. Samuel Alito is 72. John Roberts just turned 68 last month. The three Trump appointees, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, are still in their 50s. I've long thought that the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> John Paul Stevens didn't retire until he was 90 years old. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died as a justice at age 87. If Amy Coney Barrett, who was 48 when she's confirmed, stays on the court until she's 87, she'll be a justice in the year 2059. So it's easy to imagine five or six of these justices remaining on the court for the next decade or two. And so I think the bottom line is you reflect on the Supreme Court from last year, or think about what I've talked about tonight for this term, or think about what I'm going to talk about next month for the longer term future, is that if you're politically conservative, this is a time to be jubilant. This is what conservatives have wanted for a half century, a staunch conservative majority among the justices. And if you're politically liberal, it's a time to be petrified. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to take questions about these cases, other ones that are on the docket this term, including the ones that have been argued yesterday and today, or anything else about the Supreme Court. And I know the ushers will take the questions, get the questions, and I'm thrilled to answer them. All right, I'm right here, uh, right in front of you. But uh, okay. so I guess I ask when you put up, put it on these very pessimistic terms. And I listen to like a fairly lefty uh, podcast that breaks down Supreme Court cases, and similar to you do, but Shelby County makes the argument that like the Supreme Court justices are just kind of making things up. They're not really using a lot of logic. They just kind of like violate the Constitution all over the place. So why hand out constitutions at this 
showing. I mean, it's a real question, and even more so when you kind of pointed out the thing about the independent judiciary and how that basically violates everything. It might just overturn the elections. What is the point of even saving this democracy? I find the latter question easier than the former question. Let me deal with both. I think it was Winston Churchill who said that democracy is a terrible form of government, but it's better than any other that's been devised. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, a republic if you can keep it. I'm very afraid of the future of American democracy, but I believe it is essential to save democracy. The goal has to be to find a way to make it much better than what it is right now. In terms of the former question, the Constitution is both a majestic, brilliant document and a deeply flawed document. It's majestic and brilliant in that a document written in 1787 that is small enough to hold in your hands right now has governed this country for all of this time. But it was also a very deeply flawed document. It has the president chosen by the Electoral College, which twice this century has meant that the loser of the popular vote has become the president of the United States. It has a Senate where every Senate gets state gets two senators. So under the Senate that just ended um, for the prior two years, Democrats and Republicans each had 50 senators, but the Democrats represented 40, more, 40 million more people than the 50 Republican senators. And race was the tragic flaw built into the Constitution. So why read the Constitution? It is the blueprint for government that's still followed. It is the document that is, in many ways, our civic religion. And if we're going to improve democracy, we have to find a way of changing the Constitution to accomplish that. And so for all those reasons, I think it's so important to have the Constitution and to, for all of us to understand the Constitution. Um, professor, do you think it's time to eliminate the Electoral College and pack the court? Because as you say, people like o Amy Coney Barrett are going to be there until all of us are deceased, or at least I am. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, sure. rather than just live in fear, sure. can we do something affirmative to prevent what I see as abuse anyway? As to your first question, Yes, I answer with conviction. As to your second question, yes, I think so, but neither is likely to happen, and we have to figure out how we overcome that. Let me take them one at a time. I think the Electoral College is an abomination for democracy. The very nature of democracy is the person who wins the popular vote should become the president of the United States. The Electoral College is even more of an embarrassment because it was born out of a desire to protect slave states. The states with large slave populations were afraid that they wouldn't get credit for those populations in the choice of the president because enslaved individuals didn't vote. Well, the Electoral College remedied that. Enslaved individuals counted as three-fifths of a person in allocating seats in the House of Representatives. The Electoral College seats are based on the sum of the senators and the representatives from each state. And this wasn't coincidental. At the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia in 1787, a delegate from North Carolina, Hugh Williamson, praised the Electoral College because it would give North Carolina representation based on its slave population. None other than James Madison, a slave owner from Virginia at the Constitutional Convention, praised the Electoral College on that basis. Never in the 20th century did the candidate who lost the popular vote become president. It happened in 2000. It happened in 2016. It almost happened in 2004. If John Kerry had won Ohio, he would have been president, though losing the popular vote. And if 49,000 votes had come out different in November 2020 in three states, Donald Trump would have been president despite losing by 7 million votes. And I think the nature of population shifts and partisan realignment it made it ever more likely that in the years to come, we're going to continue to have the danger that the candidate who wins the popular vote isn't the next president of the United States. 
But here's the problem. To change that would require a constitutional amendment. A constitutional amendment requires approval of two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states. There's no way that the states that benefit from the Electoral College would ever vote such an amendment. In terms of the latter question, I said, I think so, though I have less conviction. The reality is that unless we do something like increase the size of the Supreme Court, we are going to have a very conservative court for a long time to come. Now, I explain this just in terms of the age of the justices. But imagine the next time there's a Republican president, Republican Senate, Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito resign and let that president appoint justices in their 40s. That will keep those seats in conservative hands for a long period of time. Yale Law Professor Ian Ayers has done a statistical analysis and estimates we'll have a conservative court for the next 50 years. Now, of course, there can be unforeseen events, deaths, unexpected retirements. But if you accept that is even a likelihood, the only way to counter it is to expand the size of the Supreme Court. Now, I said I think so, but with a bit less conviction. My worry, of course, is if the Democrats were to expand the size of the Supreme Court now, we know the next time there's a Republican president, Republican Congress, they'd expand the size of the Supreme Court. And yet, I don't see what the alternative is when we're talking about a conservative court so many decades to come. But this, too, isn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen in the last session of Congress, even when there was a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, because Republican senators would have filibustered it. And it's not going to happen now with a Republican House. The size of the Supreme Court is set by statute, not the Constitution. But I don't see any chance of getting such a statute through Congress. So yes, I would favor the two changes that you suggest, but I don't see any way to bring them about right now. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that, uh, Dean, right here. Um, I also asked a question last month, and I have a two-part question tonight. Um, I do really appreciate the thorough exposition of what we're actually facing. But my first question is, why won't you call this what it is, which is not conservative, but fascist? Years ago, the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, said, these people you know, are not conservative, they're Nazis. And I think when you're looking at, and when you lay out an openly white supremacist, openly male supremacist, theocratic agenda that is rooted in the absolute shredding of the rule of law, this is what this is, this is fascist. So that's my first question. Um, and, and my second question is, I think that there's a profound imprisoning in, in being locked into thinking that what we have is all that's possible. And I would commend you and I would commend the audience to look at this constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. There is a radically different way the world could be. It's going to take an actual revolution and an unfettering of a whole different economic system. I won't back into that. But you are not going to use the channels of this system, as you just spoke to powerfully, to, you're not going to use the normal channels to stop the fascist takeover, which is being shredded in front of our eyes. As to your first question, <laughs> I'd much rather shed light than heat. I'd much rather explain as careful as I can and let people then come to their own conclusion. I worry that using labels like fascism or Nazism generate more heat than light. People can listen to what I've said, and if they believe it meets their definition of fascism, they can conclude that for themselves. But I worry that if I were to use those terms, it wouldn't help clarify, it, and that's what I'm trying to do. As to the latter, again, everybody's going to decide for themselves. Um, I believe in democracy, and I believe that if there's going to be changes, and I believe there must be, it should through peaceful means. I worry that if ever there's revolution in this country, it's not going to come from the left, it's going to come from the right. Professor, uh, what happens when the white Christian nationalist beliefs are enshrined in law and somebody says, but this conflicts with my religious beliefs, 
which say otherwise. You, you, you know, right now the pendulum is swinging one way. Cases could be made of no, by doing this, you, you know, my religious beliefs say that you have to have equality. You have to be whatever, and it's in conflict with the right white Christian nationalist agenda. My hope is that a Supreme Court that's committed to free exercise of religion will protect the religion of all, not just of white Christian nationalists. The case that I mentioned involving the high school football coach involved a Christian who said that he believed his religion required that he go on the field and kneel and pray. I would hope that the Supreme Court would have come to the same conclusion if in a Muslim who said that his religion required that he go and put a prayer rug on the ground and pray on the field. Obviously, we can't know until the case comes up. If you want a case, though, that I think is now pending in the lower courts that will really give us a sense of, is the court going to do that? Some lawsuits have been filed in Florida, Kentucky, and Indiana by Jewish women challenging those state laws that prohibit abortion. And to put those lawsuits in their strongest context, imagine that there's a Jewish woman or a Jewish pregnant person who desires an abortion, and imagine that the doctor says that the health of this person is endangered by continuing the pregnancy. Under that person's religious beliefs, and what many in Judaism believe, human personhood begins at birth, and so the pregnant person's life deserves priority over the fetus's life. But in those states, Florida, Kentucky, Indiana, there's no exception to allow abortion for the health of the woman. And so the woman, the pregnant person says, my religion requires that I have an abortion in these circumstances, even when the state law prohibits it. If the Supreme Court is true to its desire to protect free exercise religion, I think we need to rule in favor of women in those circumstances. Now, that doesn't strike down the whole anti-abortion statute, but at least we have a religious exemption. It'll be interesting to see as those cases come up whether the court's commitment to free exercise religion really is for all religions or if it's just a Christian court protecting the rights of Christians in their religious freedom. We'll see. But that's an example where I think it's going to come up. Thank you, um, Professor, for your insightful talk. Um, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that the Supreme Court, the current Supreme Court, has given insufficient consideration to the, the very human consequences of their decisions. Um, and, and I'm sure you mentioned this in your book, but I was wondering how you might respond to the claim that as a judicial body, it's not the, the role of the Supreme Court to make um, judgments about uh, um, the consequences of the decisions, uh, the argument that that those, those that should be left to legislative bodies to decide and that, that, that um, the democratic process is characterized by um, the, the legislative system and process. Um, and just the, the general idea that the, that the court has no place in intervening with that process. Um, I think personally maybe uh, judicial review is necessarily a kind of judicial activism, but I was wondering what your response to those sure. claims might be. One could oppose all judicial review as being anti-democratic. Because any time the court strikes down an act of a legislature, an executive action, it's overruling something that popularly elected governors have done. And yet, since 1803 in Marbury versus Madison, judicial review has been a core aspect of the American government system. Now, in answer to your specific question, no right in the Constitution has ever been found to be absolute. The Supreme Court has even said, as to the most basic and important rights, the government can interfere if it has a compelling interest and there's no other way to achieve it. What I said early in my lecture is called strict scrutiny. So the government can discriminate based on race if it meets strict scrutiny. The government can infringe freedom of speech if it meets strict scrutiny. The government can interfere with free exercise of religion if it meets strict scrutiny. In all of these instances, what this says is the government can act 
if it has a compelling purpose, doesn't that then require that the court look to the consequences? So, for example, with regard to the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment isn't absolute. In fact, from 1791 until 2008, not one federal, state, or local gun regulation was struck down. And in deciding the meaning of the Second Amendment, I think the court should be looking at the human consequences. There were many studies that showed that laws like the one in New York that was invalid by the Supreme Court last June saved a significant number of lives. Or take the example of West Virginia versus EPA. As Justice Kagan pointed out in her dissent, there is no doubt that climate change is endangering the planet. Shouldn't the court, in deciding the powers of the EPA, take that into account? And so I think it's the very nature of constitutional law in the nature of judicial review, that they have to take into account the human consequences. I think what the court's doing now is just following the conservative political agenda. I mean, think about the decisions from the last week of June of last year, where the Supreme Court said that the government, in certain circumstances, is constitutionally required to subsidize religious schools, that there's no right to abortion, that there's broad protection of the ability to have guns, and that the EPA lacks the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. Unless you believe that the framers in 1787 and 1791 had the same views as the current Republican platform, it's clear that what was going on is these justices were reading their Republican conservative ideology into the Constitution. And so I do think it's important. I think it's inevitable that courts consider the human consequences. And I think the current court is forgetting that in the name of advancing their conservative political agenda. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. Good to see you again. Tell us, if you will, about the issue of free speech and a case currently pending which charges a rapper with a homicide involving the death of someone who was listening to this person's music. Sure. The case is Counterman versus Colorado, and it'll be argued in the Supreme Court in April. The Supreme Court in the mid-1960s said that there's a category of speech unprotected by the First Amendment and called it true threats. The case was a case called United States versus Watts, and it involved a federal law still on the books that makes it a crime to threaten the president of the United States. And the Supreme Court said, true threats are unprotected by the First Amendment. And the court said, we have to distinguish between what's a true threat as opposed to mere hyperbole. Well, the Supreme Court has never defined what's a true threat. And there's a split among the lower courts. Some lower courts say it's a true threat if a reasonable person would feel threatened under the circumstances. That's what the law would call an objective test. Doesn't matter what this person had in mind. If a reasonable person would feel threatened by the speech, then that's a true threat. Other courts have said, in order to be a true threat, the person engaged in the speech must have a subjective desire to threaten another. It's about that person's own mental state. And so the issue in Counterman versus Colorado is, in order to show that it's a true threat, do you need to show that Counterman had the desire to threaten? Or is it enough to show that a reasonable person would feel threatened under the circumstances? And the Supreme Court has never answered that question. That's the legal question before the court. Um, my own answer may surprise you, since I'm a strong free speech advocate. I believe the former is the better approach. I don't think that people should have the right to cause others to reasonably fear for their safety. Imagine a student is walking across a college campus and imagine an angry group surrounds that student. And imagine that student feels threatened as to his or her safety. I think those who made the student feel threatened so long as it's a reasonable fear should be able to be punished even if their desire wasn't to actually threaten, and even if they never struck a blow. But it'll be interesting to see what the Supreme Court does in that case. Counterman versus Colorado, gonna be argued in April and decided by the end of June. 
Professor Chemerinsky, you mentioned that one of the that several of the cases that you talked about were funded by a single individual. Yes. About how much do you think it costs to bring a court to this a case to the Supreme Court? And do you feel sometimes that the Supreme Court can almost be bought that way? I worry tremendously about access to justice in our system. It is so expensive to litigate. There are so many people with legal problems who can't get representation. If you look at those who face eviction or those who face deportation, many studies have been done that show that if somehow they can get a legal aid lawyer or other attorney, they have a far greater chance of prevailing. And yet millions of people go to court each year in California alone who don't have an attorney. In the Supreme Court, that's not the same kind of a problem. I mean, obviously, it costs money to get there. Um, but the reality is there's lots of lawyers who will take cases for free in the Supreme Court. It's sufficiently prestigious for law firms to do this. Um, in fact, the lawyers compete to get cases. Um, and um, so I'm less worried at the Supreme Court level of the costs of litigation because there really is a Supreme Court bar that's willing to take cases for free. I've argued seven times in the Supreme Court and have never been paid a penny for any of that litigation. Um, after the um, Roe, versus, Roe versus Wade outcome, it was a big, big backlash for and helped the Democrats. Could any of those other cases that are coming up help the Democrats again, like with the, um, any of them, the diversity? It's a great question, and there's no doubt that the overruling of Roe did create a backlash. It was seen in states like Kansas that affirmed abortion rights. It was seen in the November 2022 elections. Um, if you look at the three areas that I talked about, is the first, overall, the American public opposes affirmative action. In fact, there was just an initiative on the ballot in California a few years ago to abolish Proposition 209. And it lost with 60% of the voters wanting to continue Prop 209 and the ban on affirmative action. So I don't see the Supreme Court eliminating affirmative action as being unpopular or fueling a backlash. In terms of the third of the examples that I talked about, um, the court protecting a right of people to discriminate on account of their religion, Again, I don't know that it would fuel a backlash. It doesn't resonate with people in the same way as taking away a constitutional right that every woman of reproductive age in this country has had throughout her reproductive life. The middle category of cases that I talked about, I don't know if they fuel backlash, but they worry me greatly because they make it harder to use the political process to bring about change. If the Supreme Court and Merrill versus Milligan says, you can't challenge election district based on race, it's going to really encourage state legislatures to do even more to harm the voting interests of voters of color. And if the Supreme Court adopts the independent state legislature theory, we're going to lose state courts as a crucial way of enforcing the Constitution. I don't know that it'll cause a backlash, but I worry it will really further undermine the political process. Uh, first of all, on behalf of all the Barbary alumni in the audience, I want to thank you for helping me pass the California State Bar. Uh, thank you. For those who don't know what that's a reference to, when students graduate from law school, they take a course to get ready for the bar exam. And one of the courses is a course called Barbary, and I've been lecturing for them since 1986. So I've taught a lot of students in California and around the country getting ready for the bar exam. But thank you for the kind words. Uh, my question is a little more prosaic than most of these have been so far. It's about Twitter versus, and I'm sure. afraid I've only seen it spelled. I haven't heard it pronounced. Tamna. Tamna. Okay, so you know what it is. Yeah. There seems to be some sort of mixture of public utility law, 
criminal liability under aiding and abetting theories and free speech. So sure. I'll just hand it over to you and just exactly. ask you what your, your take on it is after you explain. What Twitter versus Tamina was argued this morning in the Supreme Court. And another case about the internet was argued yesterday in the Supreme Court, Gonzalez versus Google. Uh, let me talk about each of these cases because you do have to take the two cases together. Yesterday's case focused on an incredibly important provision of federal law, Section 230. Section 230 was adopted in 1996, and it says that internet and social media platforms can't be held liable for what's placed on them, and internet and social media platforms can't be held liable for what they refuse to place on their platforms. Professor Jeff Kosel wrote a book titled The 26 Words That Created the Internet, saying that Section 230 was absolutely essential to creating the internet. There's no way that the internet and social media would function as it does if the internet platforms were liable for what was there. And that what's there would be far worse if they could be liable for what they refused to place there. There's a lot of criticism of Section 230, but there's no agreement about what's wrong with it. Republicans say that internet platforms engage in too much content moderation. Texas and Florida have adopted laws prohibiting internet platforms from engaging in content moderation. Liberals believe and Democrats believe that there's not enough content moderation. So New York adopted a statute that required that internet platforms engage in more moderation of hate speech. That was declared unconstitutional by a federal district court in New York a week ago yesterday. California adopted a law requiring internet platforms do more to protect children. It's in this context that Gonzalez versus Google came to the court. It's a lawsuit by the estate of a person who died from a terrorist act in France and says that Google, through its algorithms, caused more attention to be drawn to these terrorist groups. And by using an algorithm, it wasn't a passive receiver, but instead it was itself engaged in publishing and editing. Well, of course, all social media platforms use some kind of algorithm. And the question is, does that by itself mean they lose Section 230 protection? My sense of the oral argument yesterday is it didn't go well for the challenger. It went much better for Google. And it looked like the Supreme Court's not willing to take away the protection of Section 230 and create what the just we're talking about would be a huge flood of litigation. Twitter versus Tamina that was argued this morning is a different issue. Federal law prohibits materially aiding or abetting terrorist activity. And the question is, if Twitter contains material that would be regarded as assisting terrorist activity, can Twitter be held liable for doing that under federal criminal law? And it seemed that the justices this morning were saying that yes, at least in certain circumstances, an internet platform could be punished for having terrorist material or material that assists terrorist activity. Um, the two cases are really significant. I think that Gonzalez versus Google is the more important of the two because Section 230 is so crucial to the functioning of the Internet. If the Supreme Court guts it, it will change the Internet as we know it. Holding Internet platforms liable for terrorist activity I think would have less effect because they already do a good deal of content moderation for that. They would just need to do more. But those are the two cases, and they'll be decided again by the end of June. Hi, Professor. Um, a little bit more of a theoretical question. In your, in your latest book, you talk about how you were involved in writing the charter for the city of Los Angeles and how very quickly after that took effect, um, there were issues that came up that uh, none of you could, could answer to have envisioned. And so there were problems that couldn't really be solved uh, in, in a way that could point to um, the intentions uh, in, in writing the charter. And I wonder what, what you think the, uh, the originalists on the court and anybody with that kind of viewpoint, how they would answer to, to that kind of problem. How, how they would say, how would they rectify those, you know, that kind of problem. The point I was trying to make is 
that there's an epistemological problem with originalism. So many people are involved in drafting and ratifying a constitutional provision. It's a fiction to say there was an intent to be discovered. And also, it's a fiction to say that their intent can resolve the issues that are before us today. And I thought a good example of that, and so I use it in the book, is the experience of charter reform in Los Angeles. And for those of you who are here between 1997 and 1999, you might recall that Los Angeles went through a Byzantine process where we had two different charter reform commissions simultaneously trying to draft a new charter. One was appointed by the Los Angeles City Council. The other was elected by the voters. And I was elected from the 5th Council District to be one of 15 members of the elected commission and then chosen as chair. And we went through an intense process for two years. And then we came together with one proposal from both commissions that the voters adopted in June of 1999. And almost as soon as it was adopted, an issue came up in terms of the meaning of a term limits provision. One small provision in a 100-page document, and immediately got calls from the lawyers from both sides of the litigation. And they said, what did your charter commission think? And I said, we never considered that issue. And of course, that's true of the Constitution. There's so many things they never thought of. Well, the Los Angeles Superior Court came to a conclusion and said, the intent of the voters with regard to this provision was, there was no intent of the voters of that provision. No one talked about that provision in charter reform or in the adoption of the charter. And I think to a large extent, the same thing is true with regard to the Constitution. Um, now, Justice Scalia answers by saying that if we work really hard, we can find the original meaning of a constitutional provision. And that's his answer. I'm skeptical. And I want to talk a lot in my next lecture on March 22nd about originalism, because it is now the dominant form of constitutional interpretation on the Supreme Court and what it's going to mean and what I see are the problems of it as being. So. Hi, Professor. Um, my question is about the Second Amendment. I've sort of come to the conclusion that... Could you just speak up a little bit? Yes. My question is about the Second Amendment. And I've sort of come to the conclusion that the only way to prevent all of these mass murders and, and everything is to repeal the Second Amendment, which, you know, that's a fool's errand. But I was wondering what kind of popular argument could be made that might sway the populace, sort of the anti-NRA. I was thinking maybe framing it in a state's rights kind of thing if there is no constitutional provision. Oh, the states just make their own laws. Isn't that what you all want? Um, can you think of some good sure. arguments that might sway people? From 1791 to 2008, I said, not one federal, state, or local gun regulation was struck down by the Supreme Court. During all this time, the Supreme Court said, the Second Amendment means what it says. It's a right to have guns for purpose of militia service. The Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It was only when there was a conservative majority on the court in 2008, and again in 2022, that the Supreme Court interprets the Second Amendment as a right of individuals to have guns. Now, you mentioned states' rights in June of 2022, the Supreme Court struck down the New York law and implicitly the California law that limited the ability of concealed weapons in public. They rejected the state's rights argument. Since the Supreme Court's decision in June of 2022, lower courts have struck down so many gun regulations. Two courts have declared unconstitutional the laws that prohibit selling or possessing guns without serial numbers, so-called ghost guns. Federal court has struck down a Texas law that says those under 21 can't have guns in public. I mentioned to you that just a couple of weeks ago, in a case called United States versus Rahimi, the Fifth Circuit struck down a federal law that says those under restraining orders in domestic violence cases can't have guns. Um, I think the toll of gun violence is so enormous in this country, and unlike any other country in the world, I would hope that would be the impetus for allowing gun regulation. But the conservatives on the current Supreme Court 
very much believe otherwise. And in terms of amending the Constitution to eliminate the Second Amendment, I don't know how you get two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states to do that. So I don't have a solution, but I see an enormous problem. And I see the Supreme Court at the core of that problem in keeping states from being able to adopt sensible, essential gun regulations. Thank you. Um, you made a convincing argument that uh, we shouldn't expect a court that might reverse these decisions in the next 50 years. Um, so this is mostly a hypothetical, but um, is there a path to redemption uh, of the integrity of the Supreme Court um, if there were a progressive court at some point in the future that is in particular stare decisis um, because it seems like to go back they'd have to just flop again um, you know without logic. yes I am hopeful and I think it's so important to emphasize that hope anything the Supreme Court does the Supreme Court can change and just as the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade so can another court overrule Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization. Just as the Supreme Court, in an unprecedented way, protected gun rights, so can another court rule differently. And we don't have to wait for the U.S. Supreme Court. So much can be done under state courts and state constitutions. The right to abortion, for example, has been protected in many states since June 24th of 2022, since the Dobbs decision. And I think we need to look much more to state courts and state constitutions. We need to find ways to use the political process to accomplish things where we can't get them through the United States Supreme Court. So I don't minimize the consequences of having a court. I am very afraid of what this court's going to do. But I also believe that we still have the tools to advance liberty, to advance equality in the future. Hello, um, I have a question about discrimination against Zionists at your own school that you teach at. Sure. For those of you unfamiliar, a student group at Berkeley Law School put it in their um, charter that any Zionist or person with Zionist views was banned from speaking at UC Berkeley Law School. Not quite, not quite. Let me, let me, uh, let me, I'm glad to discuss this. Let me try to do so briefly because it's late and I think we're at the end of the question period, but I'm glad to talk about this. Um, on the first day of last semester, I learned that the Law Students for Justice in Palestine had adopted a bylaw and urged other student groups to adopt a bylaw that they wouldn't invite any speakers who supported, quote, Zionism, comma, the apartheid state of Israel, comma, or the Palestinian occupation. I immediately issued a letter at all the leaders of student groups saying, I support the free speech rights of student groups, but I believe that this bylaw is inconsistent with our values as a law school, that indeed under the bylaw, I could not be invited to speak because I support the existence of Israel, though I criticize many of its policies. A handful of student groups adopted the bylaw, the vast majority didn't. And my position was then and continues to be that student groups can decide what speakers to invite on the basis of their views. I think the First Amendment law is absolutely clear that groups that are holding events get to decide the views that will be expressed at those events. On the other hand, I believe that the bylaw is inconsistent with our values as a law school, and I condemn the bylaw. And that's been my position since this happened in August, and it continues to be my position today. I certainly do everything I can to support the Jewish students at the school, but at the same time, I support the free speech rights of all the students, including the Law Students for Justice in Palestine group. But glad to talk about that more than after the session or at any other time. Are there other questions? Are we done? <laughs>
I'm, I'm doing whatever you tell me. We're done. Great, thank you.